So the, the reading this morning is taking from, taken from Mark chapter 5, verse 21 to 24, and then skipping forward to 35 on to 43. And you can find it in the Church Bibles on page 1007. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered round him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means... Little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this, and he told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, morning, everybody. Thanks, uh, Jenny, very much for the reading. Keep the uh, Bibles open. We'll come back to the uh, Mark uh, chapter 5 in a moment. But before I do that, I want you to just think for a moment, maybe turn to our neighbour and, uh, and have a chat. What are the greatest threats to humanity? What is it that we as human beings fear most? Have a think. Turn to neighbours, have a conversation, and let me know over coffee in about 45 minutes. That'll be fine. <laughs> Okay, let's, uh, let's gather up your thoughts. And it's at moments like this that I pine for an overhead projector. Um, if you don't know what one is, talk to your grandparents, they'll tell you all about overhead projectors. Um, let's have some suggestions then. What are the greatest threats to humanity? What are people most afraid of? Any ideas? Death, well that's been a bit of a clue all the way through this morning. So good, yes, that's a good answer to the question. What else were you thinking? Nuclear war, good. Other people, yep. Other ideas, yep. Climate change, yep. Our sick planet, yes. Yep, not looking after the planet, yes. Illness, war. James, stick that slide back up. We've got various items on this which are, all appear in those sorts of lists. A number of them you'll recognise. Interesting those on the, on the right hand side. Ridicule, mockery, isolation and rejection. And public speaking, bottom left hand corner, always comes up, doesn't it? Interestingly, clowns have disappeared from most of these lists. They always used to be in the list, they're not there uh, currently. Which all goes to show 
that in two millennia, not much has changed. Next slide, James, please. Because in Mark 4 and 5, we've seen how Jesus has power over the natural world, over extreme weather events, power over sickness and the ritual defilement and isolation that has come from that, power over unknown powers, spiritual darkness, the devil himself. So Jesus is more powerful than. We've also seen how he's been rejected, rejected as the more powerful, rejected as dangerous and uncontrollable. Next one, James, please. So what about death? One of the truths of this morning is that each one of us has woken up one day closer to the day of our death than we were yesterday. Death is the great unknown known. We know it's going to happen. We just don't know when or where or how. And we don't quite know what's going to happen straight afterwards, do we? But given that it is inevitable, how prepared are you for it? What thought have you given to your death recently? We prepare for lots of things in life, don't we? But I imagine we're not quite as prepared for death as for some other things. Well, as you remember, as we heard at the start of our reading this, this morning, Jairus came to Jesus because his daughter was dying. Jesus helped the, uh, the woman we were thinking together about last week. And then we come to verse 35, because the delay has brought worse news. Your daughter is dead. That brings us to our first heading. Death is the end for all who do not trust in Jesus. Look at the response of the household. Your daughter's dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? In other words, for them, Jesus is just a healer. The situation is now way beyond his ability to help. Why bother? But notice what Jesus says to Jairus, verse 36. Don't be afraid, just believe. Jairus, you came to me when things were very serious. Trust me now. Here's a step on for you in your faith. Who do you think I am? What do you think I can do? So they uh, come to the house. Verse 39, verse 39, Jesus goes in and says to them, why all this commotion and wailing? Because the mourners are in. And if we've watched Middle Eastern grief and uh, funerals, you'll have seen the, the professional mourners. That, that's how it's done. Jesus says to them, the child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. You see... We're the professionals. We've been to many, many, many deaths. We are the mourners. We get called in when that's where things have got to. Jesus, what does he know about death? We're the experts. He's missed his moment. This is now our time. Death is inevitable. It's no surprise, is it, that humanity rages against the dying of the light. We do all we can to avert it, to avoid it, to reverse it, to return from it. Because for most of humanity, this life is all there is. And we rejoice in greater life expectation within society. It's a sign of human progress. And it's something that marks out inequalities in our world and in our society. And we know all the things that, that affect it in terms of working conditions, clean air and clean water, housing, diets, exercise, and access to medical services. 
And you, like me, will probably have found yourself saying, oh, it was great for Aunt Ethel. She was desperate to get to Christmas, desperate to hang on for for the wedding. And wasn't it lovely that she was able to do that? But you'll also have seen and known people, maybe some here, who are desperate to go home to be with the Lord, but still stick around. Well, I found this uh, quote from... uh, a psychologist from the Washington School of Medicine. The studies published to date have not convincingly established that death can be postponed through the force of will or hastened by the loss of desire to live. There have been some slightly sort of wackier ideas around, haven't there, about how we might deal with this problem. Back in the, uh, the 60s, freezing was, was all the rage. And the thought was that if we could freeze the human body and then bring it back later then healing for those particular diseases might have been discovered. And maybe we could replace the necessary parts subsequently because that technology would now be available. Well, if any of you invested in that, uh, it's worth knowing that uh, all but one of the companies in the 60s and 70s who offered these services are now out of business. And yet, in a recent edition of the week, there was some research done where the hope from what they'd done with these pig's organs was that the death of cells can be halted and their functionality restored even one hour after death. So who knows what may be coming? In the meantime, what should we do? Well, we'll carry on exercising, we'll carry on eating healthier, but we must be under no illusion that we can defeat or postpone death. It remains inevitable. It's worth remembering, too, that this can be a spiritual battle. I remember a a congregation member we had when I was at uh, Eastbourne, and uh, she was diagnosed with, uh, with cancer. And, understandably, she became very focused on her healing. And she went round various different churches in town and different uh, Christian gatherings looking for more prayer, looking for more effective prayer, looking for more encouragement about the the state, which meant the uh, disappearance, really, of her cancer. And the tragedy was, in the midst of all of that, she simply became focused on her healing, on her getting better, on this life. And she lost sight of the Jesus who was Lord of life and death. The Jesus who gave her hope for the world to come. Because without Jesus, there is no real hope, is there? Maybe hope for a pain-free, good death. Maybe to be remembered for something that we've achieved, a legacy we've left. Maybe a funeral or a thanksgiving that will say what a jolly good fellow I was and send us out singing, always look on the bright side of life. Because without Jesus, we are hopeless and helpless in the face of death. Humanity without Jesus has no answers. And we might conclude, if only Death were the end. Let's uh, look on the rest of the, the passage. Death is not the end for all who trust in Jesus. So verse 40, Jesus puts all the mourners outside. He took the child's father and mother and the disciples, Peter, James and John, who were with him, and went in to where the child was. Jesus took her by the hand, said to her, little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and walked around. Jesus' intervention is not just miraculous in that she revives. It is miraculous in the way in which she immediately is able to walk around. Now let's remember... As he goes into that room, he's faced with a dead body. And what does he do when faced with a dead body? He 
touches. He took her by the hand. What does that mean? Well, in those days, that meant Jesus was defiled. That meant he had to go through all manner of ritual washings and separation in order that the defilement, the uncleanness could go. It's uh, similar to what we saw with the woman last week. On that occasion, Jesus' purity cleansed her and restored her to her community life. Here, it's far greater. Here, he brings the girl back to life. Jesus has life in himself. He restores her life, and like the woman, she gets her life back. Unsurprisingly, the family, the parents were completely astonished. They can't believe it. It's too good to be true, surely. And because we're now back in a Jewish area, and it's not the right time for such things to be spoken about Jesus, he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this. And then a rather charming end piece, he told them to give us something to eat. How on earth could people not know? Well, let's go back to what Jesus said. He said, the child is not dead but asleep. Now, he was meaning the sleep of death. She was dead. But those at the time don't believe him. They laugh at him. Of course she's not asleep. So, Maybe the word that went round was that Jesus knew better than the mourners. You see, she was just sleeping, and Jesus woke her up, effectively. Because surely that must be easier to believe than that a carpenter from Nazareth can raise the dead. Well, can a carpenter from Nazareth raise the dead? That takes us back to the question we began the series with. When the disciples in the boat say, who is this? So, is this the Jesus you don't believe in? If that's so, let me encourage you to read more of Mark's Gospel. Read the whole thing. Look at the whole thing together. Or maybe ask a friend here at uh, St. John's to read it with you. Together discover who Jesus really is and what he came to do. But if you do believe and trust in the Lord Jesus, will you take Jesus' advice to Jairus? Don't be afraid, just believe. All the things we had on the screen earlier, all the threats that we were thinking about earlier, don't be afraid, just believe. But what we need to know is the answer to the question, when? When will we see Jesus' power in all its fullness? When will we see those threats dealt with? When will we see a new heavens and a new earth? When will we see the forces of darkness, darkness banished? When will there be no more sickness and no more death. In Jesus' day, not all storms were stilled. Not all demon-possessed people were released. Not all sick were made well. Not all the unclean were cleansed. Not all the dead were raised. He had the power then. He has the power today. And throughout history, he has rescued his people from natural disasters, delivered them from the spiritual forces of darkness, healed them, restored them to life, made them clean again. Yes, please, James. And while Jesus has won the victory on the cross, 
And while that victory was declared in his resurrection, we wait for this all-powerful Jesus to be made a reality to everybody. Think of it a bit like this. When the United States goes through its presidential elections, votes are cast, votes are counted, the ridiculously complicated electoral college system is worked out, and we know who the winner is. Later, that victory is certified, declared, if you like, by the two houses, the House and the Senate. And then there's the inauguration. And at the inauguration, the president takes the full powers of his office. All we're waiting for when it comes to the Lord Jesus is that inauguration, when he will be seen by everybody to be the all-powerful Lord that he is. Then... All the ravages of God's curse on humanity, all rebellion, all sinfulness, will be dealt with. The devil and all his supporters, our declining health, our separation of God due to our own selfishness and sinfulness, death itself will be removed. As the book of Revelation says, no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, no more night. The day when Jesus returns is the day when his victory becomes a reality, a day when all have to bow the knee to him, the day on which all evil and wickedness, all sin and selfishness, all unbelief will be banished, the second death. Because the Jesus we've been looking at in these chapters, is the one who has power for this life, in this life, but all the more for the future beyond the grave. Because of him, there is a future for all who trust and a certainty to which we can look forward. Because of him, death is not the end. So, will we keep our eyes fixed on that eternal future? Will we live for that future? A few weeks ago, some very close friends of mine came home from work and they found their teenage son dead from a heart attack. In his Bible, they found these words written, Christ brings life. That was where he was. His youth leader and friends in the youth group testified at his thanksgiving that that was true. And that's the certainty that will permeate Rosamond's funeral and thanksgiving later this week. It's why gathered round a graveyard Christians will sing, thine be the glory, risen conquering son, endless is the victory. Thou or death hast won. It's ridiculous, isn't it? We're standing by an open grave. There's a coffin there. Death's clearly won. But we know it hasn't. Because we have the sure and certain hope that this Jesus defeated humanity's last and greatest enemy, death itself. And the raising of Jairus' daughter is a glorious signpost to Jesus' resurrection and the eternity awaiting all who trust in him. Because Jesus is the all-powerful Lord over the natural world, over the spiritual realm, over sickness and death. And because of him, we have nothing to fear from those threats and fears we considered earlier. Because of him, we can hear and act on Jesus' words to Jairus. Don't be afraid, just believe. And so we are better equipped to answer the question, who is this? Let's bow our heads and we'll pray together.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for these accounts in the Gospels which show us wonderfully clearly who Jesus is. Please, Father, grant us to know, love and serve him as the all-powerful Lord. Please grant us not to be fearful, but to believe and trust in him. And this we ask for your glory's sake. Amen.